Hi, good day, everyone. I hope you all are doing well. Uh, today, I have a very interesting guest, and we just met by chance. My name is Dr. Nathan Mukhlin, the psychology psychotherapist, teacher, and analyst therapist, and I am a mental health advocate and autism advocate. And there's a lot of things that I'm doing, but uh, today I'm going to talk with uh, another amazing, whether you call it strong, amazing, vibrant, uh, smiley woman, Irini from uh, Netherlands, Europe. And uh, she has some interest because you were, she was questioning me about autism and there are a lot of things that we need to unfold today. But uh, let me ask you to introduce yourself and because you just said that you are doing different things, you just, you just mentioned something about books and you also mentioned something about trade you are doing. So uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, well, welcome to you all. Welcome to the audience. Uh, my name is Irene and I'm based in the Netherlands, which is a country in Europe. Um, I have a diagnosis of autism since 2008, which is almost 15 years ago. Um, and for now, I'm seeing it as a strength, as something that is part of me. And it gives me a lot of insights in my daily life. And I will come back on that later. And in my daily life, I am working full time uh, at a worldwide, worldwide uh, trading company. Uh, we trade a lot of dairy products and I'm based in the export department where I am responsible for all the export documentation, especially for the French speaking countries, because I studied French linguistics in university. And when I'm not working at the export departments, I'm teaching French. Uh, for students and I am working as a human book for an association and organization called Human Library International. So like you are doing so many things and your work is related to communication if I'm not wrong. It's like communication and collaboration with the people if I'm not wrong over here. If that's causing trouble? No, no. Why I'm saying this? I don't answer the question. Let me tell you something. When you talk about autism, because you said that you are diagnosed in autism, with autism, or you're autistic woman, when you were um, like in 2008, and when we see about autism, the first thing that came and the first symptoms that are about communication, like deficit in communication, you know, deficit in mm -hmm. socialization. I don't even like the word of deficit, but in our terminology, deficit is different than other terminology, and you are mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. deficit is a different word for you. But that's why I asked the question from you because it's all about communication that you cannot communicate, exactly. you cannot socialize. But if you look toward yourself, you're not just communicating with the community you are around, with your family. You're talking to the customers, you're talking to the companies, you're talking to different countries, and then you are teaching other language too. That is French. So it's like you are breaking a barrier and we want people to understand that autism is different than the books. And you need a different criteria. You need to understand that you are talking about behaviors. You are talking, you're talk, not talking about the skills that autistic individuals have, especially autistic women have. And uh, women are different than boys. We all know about that. But uh, but in a community, we know that. But people don't understand that. They think only boys have autism. It's not the reality. So um, sure. when you find out, because you know the journey of diagnosis is a little bit difficult. Because a lot of uh, individuals that I'm working with, um, like the NDA community that I'm working with, they are uh, they came to me as a uh, as a person who have depression or anxiety. Their main concern was about autism. So I just read it before a um, few months before that autism uh, is more like the people who come to you with depression and anxiety they are late diagnosed autistic or ADHD individuals. Like if you look toward that, you would see the pattern in their life. And uh, uh, when you came to know about your autism, how you get this idea and how you wanted to go and get the diagnosis and that, how was that experience for you? That's a good question because I, um, I always had the feeling when I was young that I was having autism, but I didn't, uh, I wasn't tested because I grew up in a small community and when you were different, so for example, disabled, 
-hmm. you were excluded so you were put in the out group instead of the in group so when I was younger I always felt uh, there was something going on because I had different interests than the people in my primary school the communication between them and me was different and it went on for years and years Um, when I was uh, in middle school so in high school I was bullied because I was different and as I didn't have uh, that much self-confidence in fact, I had lack, lack of self confidence. I was always masking. Mm. I was very easy victim to blame and to, to bully on. So that was quite heavy for me because I didn't know how to behave. I didn't know what code to use to defend myself. And I was always acting. I was always acting to be somebody else. And uh, acting is uh, a feature of people with autism because they don't want to show their true selves. Exactly. So... When I was um, graduated from high school, I went to business school in the Netherlands. And one of the things that was very particular over there was the fact that organizationally, the organization was a mess. It was chaotic. Mm -hmm. And for me, uh, for people having autism, chaos is killing because it gets people out of control. They are arranging a lot of things. They can't um, process the features. They can't process the stimulation. So they're always focusing on that details instead of details of studies. Mm -hmm. And that was the same with me. And during the time I was having a failure to succeed. So I had an anxiety to fail. Mm -hmm. And I was searching out for it in the form of a student psychologist. And they had a collaboration with the university. So I came to the university I was contacted I went um, to see a psychologist and we had a treatment plan for six sessions because it was for short term and we made a plan which was quite nice Um, however every three weeks I went there with the same recurrent problem Mm -hmm. so lack of self-confidence anxiety to fill uh, chaotic Uh, and chaos gives me stress so the same recurrent problems and then I thought okay something else must be there because I can't put my finger on it I need to have something for the long term and then I was transferred to a psychologist uh, who specialized in people with autism and I had two days uh, of visiting the practice Mm -hmm. And I was getting me tested. And after two weeks, I got my diagnosis, which was autism. Mm -hmm. Well, in fact, ASD, autism spectrum disorder. Um, And for me, on the one side, it was a relief because now I knew, okay, it is autism. It is a form of autism. And I can see how to fulfill my life, how to live my life. Because I live my life, but in another way, not directed. On the other hand, uh, when thinking about the diagnosis, I thought, okay, you see, it, the proof's there. I will be excluded because people who are disabled will be excluded. They won't be accepted for the full person who uh, they are. So just get rid of me, jump off a bridge, uh, get me shot. I want to get out. However, I didn't make that choice because I knew that autism is a chronic disease. So it means it cannot be cured. There's no medication. However, there are ways uh, for making it more um, livable because autism is an adaptation of yourself, but also an adaptation of the environment. And if that can be balanced, you can have a very functional life. So I made that choice. However, when I got my diagnosis, the social healthcare system in the Netherlands wasn't as broad and progressed as it is right now. So I really want to have a therapy in the hospital I was living nearby. Unfortunately, uh, it was one of the two um, specialistic treatments offered. So all of the people in the Netherlands were coming there and there was a waiting list for two years. So it was quite hard, but after 18 months, I was accepted over there. And it really was an eye-opener for me because I I knew a lot of things about autism. And then I got an introduction and it was it was such a relief. It was such a relief. It gave me so much directions. And it was really helpful. 
So, like you describe the journey, and maybe it took you five or ten minutes to describe everything. But when if when we look toward the way you describe it, uh, uh, I know it feel hard because when you look like when you feel that you are different from other people and you don't belong to them. Uh, I remember thinking about you know living in the Mars and you know some like you know all those stories, all those Star Trek or Doctor Who or time travel story. Somehow it looked like so familiar to you and it like so belonging to you because you knew that all the time you're looking toward the people and all the time you're, you're, you're looking toward the people how to behave and you will look toward them either you need to laugh on this situation or you need to cry on that situation you know like yes. i was working with yes. a girl and she told me that she don't know how to behave in a certain situation so uh, there was some uh, death in her family and she thought she said that i didn't know how to do that how to cry so in the realm of that high form of uh, you know emotional experiences she was not able to sit over there so she left that room and she go away and everybody was pushing her to come to come to come and sit there and uh, uh, to cry at this place and she was saying that i was i am so guilty that i did not find that you know so yeah you need to understand that the uh, we all need to understand that the emotions are different for us maybe expression are different for us understanding is different for us and uh, the people around us they are sometimes confusing too people are confusing to like for example if you look toward yourself there was sure. so you you might thought that you are uh, you don't have you know a confidence uh, like anxiety you have but if you look toward yourself right now the profession that you have is all about confidence i mean you cannot utter a single word from your mouth if you don't have a confidence and now you are there you are uh, you're working in a chain and you're working in an organization where you are working worldwide and if you talk about teaching teaching a language that is french language and um, that is another uh, thing too and the point we all need to maybe understand maybe as an autistic individual that the more we get into our own skin because we need to understand that when we are masking and we, when we are not masking and sometimes you don't even understand that you are masking or what is your masking behavior and what is your reality what you are feeling about that so all those things are difficult and um, but eventually you get to that place like you said that when you get your diagnosis it, it is such a such a relief and everybody says so that when they get this diagnosis it is a relief for them and whenever they are hear that somebody is trying to change them somebody is trying to mess up with their genes mess up with their genome trying to treat them imposing medication on them that's why the the autistic community and neurodivergent community are upset about that and there's no other reason they're upset but they are upset for that and we need to understand that um even as autistic individual if your two women in, is in the room they both are different so you will not find to look alike maybe behave alike autistic and uh, like i'm working since 2011 and i did not encounter an autistic individual which are look alike maybe mm. symptoms might might be you know somehow they are they are you know identical but even then the representation of their symptoms is totally different and that is a challenging thing that is the understanding that everybody is different so as neurotypical world is also different and the more you study about that the more it get in interesting for you and the more you get thirsty for that what is more into that what is amazing about that what is you know uh, different things you will encounter how much talented an autistic individual could be you know so that is yeah. because if you look toward them they're autistic i mean they're artistic not they're autistic but they're artistic they're engineers they're scientists they're researchers you know and they are doing amazing interventions in the world so um the geniuses yeah they're genius and there is no doubt about that and if you look toward yourself uh because we talk about interest like special interest maybe hyper fixation what is your special interest i speak a lot of languages okay i'm a language person so i speak she's dutch also, she doesn't speak a lot of languages by the way she's also i speak the regions i speak dutch english german uh french italian and spanish and i'm starting to learn swedish because my parents have a second home over there 
So I really love languages. And next language is I am doing a lot of sports. I love dancing. So it's like, it's more like you're going toward communication side, you know, because yeah. um, uh, the dancing is the communication of the body. The body. That it's body language. Body and it's more like alignment, you know, because if you, True. you are aligned with yourself, the space around you, the, I don't know what it is called, it is aerodynamic, or I don't know, so we can name for that. Aerodynamics, right. It's aerodynamic space around you, <laughs> how you balance your body and how you, you know, uh, because that is interesting thing. We, as yeah. artistic individual, we already have eight senses, and one of them is included the, you know, body balancing thing and introspection, and you know some other things also. So, um, language and different. Language. So, if you look toward the language side, do you think that because uh, that was the reason I speak about communication deficit because that is the word used in books or articles wherever you go. Do you think that it is going to define you that you cannot communicate, you cannot socialize? How does you see if you we look toward just two traits in you about uh, you know this communication side and this um, expression side? Concerning my autism and my communication? Yeah. Um, well, for me, it's always been very hard to see social cues, so not reading people. So, for example, uh, I'm having a conversation with you. I can read you very well, and that's which is fine. Um, however, when I am in network meetings, for example, on my work or when I was studying, we had a lot of network meeting, meetings with my association. I can read people, but sometimes I can't read the people and the body language because it can be very contradictory. It can be a very large contradiction. And for me, it was very exhausted because I was trying to keep the conversation uh, going. And I can network very well, but if you want to expand it, for example, in a more thoroughly friendship, for me, it's very hard because I don't know how it works. I don't know the cues. I don't know how to react. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, I am doing a lot of things by heart. So a lot of expressions are in my mind, are in a drawer in my brain. Sometimes in when situations are exceptions, for example, when exceptional situations are occurring, it's hard because I don't know what to say. I'm empty, my head is full, I can't function. And for people not having awareness of how autism is uh, working, it can be very hard. Um, to understand why I can't say anything, why I can't show or express my clear communication at that particular moment. And that's sometimes very hard. So what helped me a lot, I don't know how you are preparing your meeting, but uh, what I do is I prepare myself well enough. You know, like this is uh, interview, so I did not might, you know, I did not maybe, I did not did the preparation the way I will do for my presentations, like the usual discussions I'm talking about. Like if suppose I'm going somewhere, somewhere and I have to talk about certain things, then I will do preparation for that. I will read for that. If I have a support group, then I will read for that. I cannot yeah. go blank to some place, you know? No. But if I say this to somebody that, no, I am doing preparation, they, they don't, uh, they say that you're, you're not doing that. Like you're no. joking with us. And it's not like that. I have to do a lot of preparation. And you know, sometimes it looks very easy because I'm talking about the communication part. Communication is not about the words coming from your mouth. You know, it's your speech. Speech and communication are two different things. Speech is you speak, you utter sound, and you make a sentence and stuff like that. But how when you talk about you. communication, that is a different thing. How you're doing reciprocal communication and how you keep up, keep the track of that communication, you know, like yeah. if you keep the track of me and the moment, if, if there's a distraction, you're just going to lose the interest, not the interest, but you know, the track of that communication because, because of sensory, hyposensitivity or hypersensitivity of sounds, you know, noise and other things is going to affect the mood and going to affect the environment and going to affect the response from that person too. So if you see that somebody is a little bit hyper, it's not because 
that person is angry with you the person might be hyper because of there might be some smell around you know in that circumstances for example if there is light and light is coming to my eyes i don't like light you know so it is too much for me like i'm just giving yeah, example if it, it is sound if somebody is crying outside it would be distracting for me you know it will make me uncomfortable to sit in that scenario uh, but okay what about you like you said that if something unexpected happened you know that is somehow anxious and somehow upsetting too but the field you are working with it's all about unexpected scenario you have like you don't know what a customer is going to say you don't know about meeting board meetings uh, and even if you talk about language how you do that how you keep up with those things and how you prepare yourself for that a very good question well i learned through during the years because i embraced and accepted my autism uh, in in a very large way so that's quite good uh which is fine um uh you were just talking uh about preparation i am preparing a lot of things and for me uh predictability is very important sometimes when things cannot be prepared or cannot predicted it's uh i will lose my safe uh, space i will lose my control um one of the things i learned uh during my autism uh is uh, empathy so i know a lot about how empathy works and what it is sometimes when there are exceptions uh i learned during the my treatments in the hospital one of my therapists and my psychologist said well i mean if something for example exceptional happens just um feel the silence and feel the situation because it can be there it's not it's not bad it can be very nice i can give you an example we were having a case study and one of the studies was the fact that the brother in law of one of my uh, one of the guys who was in the same treatment as i was who was having autism as well his brother in law were he passed passed away and it was one year ago and i could see that he was very sad and he had to cry about it and i really want to learn how to cope with that situation but i didn't know how and that was one of the things i wanted to work on which was my learning goal and then the therapist said to me what are you just feel the situation because i know you can be hypersensitive and then just speak about your feeling and see what happens so that was what i did i felt the situation it came to me the energy and then i expressed first the first thing to him which came up and it was quite a relief because he was really accepting it and that was the way for me to cope with it and that was really helpful because then i thought okay it doesn't have to be perfect it can be there and it's yeah it kept me cool and when there are exceptions for example in my work or in my in the environment of my relatives i always act some sort of this way it can be there it's not bad uh, having a silence because sometimes being silent can be good too you know you were just talking about the uh, feeling that situation and, and um, i will give you the link of the interview that i did with and he is a amazing actor um i'm talking about jeremy and you will find the link of the uh, to he's autistic and he was diagnosed at the age of very young when he was first he was diagnosed with adhd then he was uh, he got medication but the medication was not working for him so he went for another diagnosis and it turned out that he's autistic and he's a he's a stage actor and he said that i am a lot of things are helping me out because i am living the life of somebody else so it's like i am living their emotions too so he said that i was playing the role of a dictator and this dictator was very angry dictator and the dictator was a kind of person who did a lot of killing so i was not able to feel the anger aggression and uh, i talked to my director and my director said that you need to sink into those feeling when you were bullied in bullied when somebody was you were angry on something you did not express your anger 
So he said that I thought about all those things and it filled yeah. me with a lot of rage. And I, you know, he said that I take out all that rage of my childhood in that character. And my co-actor told me that we are so afraid of you at that day. Like you could be so much aggressive, you know? So like he was keeping, because, you know, we don't express our aggression to other people because we, we are empathetic. We don't want to feel, you know, we don't want to hurt other people, even if they are doing bad with us, you know, even they are giving us something harm to us. We don't want to hurt them. That's how we are. We have to accept that reality because we are are very sweet people. Yeah. So this is how and it helped him a lot to, you know, bring out that rage because he was, uh, you learn masking and you learn to, you know, live the life of other people and you are acting like that. So even then, that is amazing. Well, like you said, that because sometimes it is important to understand. I was working with her and she told me that, like she was uh, 12, 13 years old. She said that I can yeah, you, you know what's what's important to you, which I really learned in my mm-hmm. in my work and outside of the work is, as autism cannot be seen sometimes from the outside because it is playing a, a huge role internally. So from in the inside. I really learn to express what I feel and what I need because when I don't, people don't know how to react. So, for example, uh, I'm working at a large company and we have a lot of departments and sometimes um, I get overstimulated and I my, then my head is full. And when my head is full, I need some time to recover because otherwise I can't function in the most optical way possible, optimal way possible. So there was a situation uh, where my manager said, well, I mean, you really need to express what's going on right now because otherwise I can't help you. I would love to help you, but if you don't express to me what's going on right now, I can't help you in the best possible way. And that was quite scary for me, but afterwards I thought, okay, this needed to be happened. This needed to happen. And it did, and it was such a big eye-opener. And that's what I always try to do. However, not everybody uh, in the world is aware of autism or otherwise they are saying A and stating B. So sometimes I do not want to share it because people are misusing it. They're abusing it. And I experienced this. That's why I always are somewhat having an anxiety still. So... Uh, my next question is, like you said that, uh, you sometimes you don't want people to know that you're autistic. So do, do you do you tell your organization that you are autistic? Do they know, know these things or do they provide you reasonable adjustment? Because it is important to understand that what your needs are, what are your sensory needs, and then they will act according to that. So are you able to get some reasonable adjustment in your environment or not? Yes, uh, I can give you two examples. I, uh, the, my current employer, I'm working there for almost two years. And I got a fixed contract, so that's quite nice. And when I was having my interviews, we had four rounds. Mm-hmm. And during the fourth round, I uh, told them that I was diagnosed with autism mm-hmm. because I did it with the two uh, um with two em- employers before my current employer, and they both fired me because of my autism. Mm. So I had already two uh, less positive experiences professionally. And I was I was very scared by sharing it because I know uh, people were stating A and doing B because they both asked me, what do you need in order to work with your autism to make your work the most functional for you and I expressed it and then in the end they fired me because uh, they said to me because of my autism they couldn't work with me I wasn't multifunctional enough or I was socially inactive Mm -hmm. or socially weird and I was quite mad about it because I expressed that in advance to them so they were aware of the fact um Second, uh, they fired me be- for the things I was vulnerable about, which I was sharing in my total openness. So I thought, okay, what will happen 
after what will happen after this. So my current employer, I expressed uh, my feelings about uh, my diagnosis of autism. And I was quite scared because I thought, okay, they can either have two choices. They can say no or they can say yes. There was nothing in between. And then uh, after 10 minutes, they gave me a ring because they made me a job offer as well as a salary offer. Um, and they said, but Irene, uh, it's so good of you sharing uh, your diagnosis of autism. That we, a, we have a lot of colleagues having autism, so what do you need? It's three years ago and it's still working. Um, one of the, but there was one thing because I started during the COVID pandemic. So they had to do a very provisional working and training scheme for me because the people who were going to train me, they were both on, mater on maternity leave. So I had to be trained um, at a distance, so from my home, because we were uh, required working from home. But that went quite well because I didn't have any rush. I didn't have any stimulations I can do it in my own space. Uh, the only negative thing was when I was coming to the office because they wanted me to experience the office life as well, there was nobody to train me. So I didn't uh, really have a very clear image and feeling of the work I'm do I was doing now. Fortunately, it changed after two weeks. So with this in mind, I am very happy that it worked out this way so it's more like you know but i was open about it even when i didn't want to do too okay you know th there's something very amazing thing i would say about uh community our community uh, and this is what i feel also that you have to find your way out if you are even working with a therapist even if you are working with a counselor or mental health professional at the end of the day you have to make your way from that the job of the professional is to elaborate things about you like this is what i do that i don't start criticizing people that you don't have this you don't have you know that we, we cannot be all and the reality of the life is if we talk about neurotypical community if we talk about the whole world everybody is different everybody come with limitation everybody is not intelligent everybody don't have a high iq everybody cannot drive you know everybody cannot cook well you know everybody cannot paint so this is the reality of the life and we have to accept the diversity side of the community and we have to accept that everybody is diverse so even either it's uh, you know either if uh, we talk about neurotypical community they need to understand that fact too and we all need to understand that we all are different every everybody have different needs so if you are doing something different for one people one person it's not that you're, you're you're doing different for that you got the courage to talk about your autism to the office uh, because you had some experience and uh, either it's good or it's bad uh, but if you didn't tell them before you you wouldn't have come to this level now you are today you know you you might not be able to create a safe space for yourself in the environment and safe space for yourself in the office that you're right now and you choose to speak up for yourself and and that was brave of you and that was like i would say that that is an amazing yeah. thing that you decided to stay on your ground maybe it was you know a, a fearful experience for you because you got rejected for that but i think we all know that we get rejected for so many things in our life like even if you talk about bullying in the classroom not having friends not a, not able to understand that how to act in certain situation and how to do certain things or how to carry out certain communication but the uh, the beauty of the human mind is that we all are different we all are unique and we all function in our own way so it's not even about exactly. superiority or inferiority nobody is superior you know it's not that we are superior or general. it's not even like that and i think we all want people to understand that what does a neurodiversity mean you might just need to maybe speak so you just don't need to give us so many things at the same time we cannot process a lot of instruction at the same time, one thing at a time, you know, systematic thing, clear instruction, we need clear goal in our life, you know, clear yes. agenda. Like, for example, if they give you some 
you know uh, assignment they need to tell you that what does what do they want from you what is the end goal that is going to help you out and i think they can do that sure true okay so let's talk about um the love of language that you have uh, because if i also like you can learn a different language english might maybe fourth language and i can read some language too i can you know maybe maybe you can you know speak something but maybe you don't understand those languages if you talk about expression like emotional expression in the language learning different languages is a unique experience how is helping you out to understand the expression in the language of emotional expression i would uh, uh, simply ask um well good question if i am talking about my french for example because i studied french and i lived in france for several years it's very um this language has a lot of um different emotions and different expressions as well as different melodies and uh i'm referring in on my master's thesis because the subject of my master's thesis was interjections and it means uh using several uh some words uh, for example to make things short so for example hey how are you doing oh, okay okay well what came out and per uh, france to be honest has different regions uh, i think pakistan has different regions as well and in some of the regions they are speaking dialects they are not speaking the standard language for example uh, in france they have the french which is spoken in, in paris which is standard french but they also have french spoken in the regions around paris or in the north the south the west and the east and what i was researching at was the fact that when people are using several words short words for example uh, subverbs how it is interpreted so for example intonations which means the tone and the voice of the word or the manner or the tone which is used of when this word is spoken or pronounced it can make a lot of sense exactly so for example if i'm speaking hey with a very high note it can have a lot another sense than when i'm speaking hey with hey well exactly. we put it it's very broader yes high and low so high intonation low intonation or high tone or low tone and it was proven what was very very interesting as well i was working together uh, on another research with this uh, german researcher christian and he was doing research of the chinese language mm -hmm. and in chinese uh, you can say a word for example this was uh, an existing word asa mm -hmm. in four different uh on four different ways so four different um notes for example, high, middle, high, low, middle, low, with four different meanings. And it was very interesting that that came out because it was the same conclusion I was I found out with my thesis. So the way a word is pronounced, for example, the if, if it's used with a high intonation or with a low intonation, it can make a lot of sense. And it's so interesting uh finding that out um and it's the same with communication in general because when for example i'm having conversation with you um being autistic or not being autistic when you have a very high energy of talking it can be perceived very different than for example when you have a very calm energy and it I still think it's very interesting to see the both interpretations. And that was one of the things I find really interesting. And you know, the thing is that like, um, I just, just, I just, this, uh, uh, maybe shared in this, my uh, last week in, in one of the book, I, I speak very fast and yes, <laughs> so many people hear so many things that you don't judge you. So, talk slow, talk slow. And I said that, do you understand that I speak, if I'm speaking fast, 
then I'm thinking fast too. And I'm writing also very fast. And my body movements are very fast. What I need, what I'm going to slow down. All the hmm? processes I need to slow it down. And that could be difficult for me. Let me tell you something else also. Like in our country, there are maybe 73 languages, maybe more than 73 languages. And basically, I belong to North. Like I belong to KP. So my language is Pashto. And that is a very high tone. We talk in very high tone. And talk very fast too. And there are so many other traits that, that you could say that could be misinterpreted maybe as autistic. Maybe people don't, do not even think about that, that you are fighting with each other. Maybe you are having a normal conversation. But for other people, we are, we are speaking very fast. So the way I am speaking, that could be a normal form of conversation in our area where I belong. But like, for example, I grew up in different uh, area that is or the other language area that you could say that English is my third or fourth language. And I heard other language too. And there, there is some Arabic version too. And there's some, you know, so the point is that mm -hmm. having so many languages around you and having different kind of, you know, tones and some tones are very high, some tones are very low, some pitch are very high, some pitch are very low. And at the end of the day, we need to understand that the, outer appearance of person is not going to determine how you're going to perform in certain things. The looks good can be cunning too. It is going to deceive you too. You need to understand that if somebody look very, you know, like for example, if there's somebody, uh, like, like let me give you some, like some example. If you talk about eye contact, in certain cultures, eye contact, giving eye contact is something like if you don't give the eye contact, it is called your your cunning. You're deceiving that person. In some cultures, if you're not giving eye contact, it's it's kind of a respect. Like you lower your gaze in front of that person. So if you talk about autistic individuals, they cannot give you eye contact. It means it means that they are lying to you. And there are so many oh, incidents okay. happened all over the world where in interrogation interrogation, police have been caught autistic individual or ADHD individual just because of these language problems or just because of these behavior problems or just because, because of these gesture problems. Like they would ask you to look at them or you know, hands up and stuff like that. So we need to understand that the culture that we have built, the way of communicating to other people, it is not necessary that it is that way. For example, if you talk about no, no have so many different contexts. But it is very difficult for autistic individual to understand no all the time no. Like what no? If I say that you want to eat something, you said no. You want to wear this dress, you said no. These are two different situations. That is a confusing situation. Exactly. So it means that I say I need to say no to everything. And if you talk about autistic community, they can get melted down on the word of no. If you tell them no. And there are so many examples of them, of this, uh, you know, of this experience too. So it is kind of a different thing because like you, like you said that uh, expression, emotional expression, voice tone, because there's a, even an interesting fact about crying too. Crying, crying is also melodious and crying have also variation. And you can understand if you are a mother or if I, I don't know that much about you. But I'm just saying that a mother can judge that the child, why the child is crying. The child is hungry, the child is happy, the child is scared. So it means that everything is communication. But understanding and difficulty to understand that communication is, is kind of a challenging for autistic community. And sometimes it is challenging, sometimes it is overwhelming. And if you, oh, and if you look toward the culture context, and if you look toward yourself and like your office people were saying that uh, there are other people, autistic people in your offices too. So how you find them? Like if you have a lot of autistic community around you, how how it help out you working or it is also still a challenge for you? Being emotional, you mean? Like overall, like are they able to understand what you want to say to them? They drain a lot of your energy. They're at your level. They're not toxic. They're understanding. You mean the people? Yeah. You mean the people in my environment? Yeah. 
Well, some of them, uh, some of the people in my network are having autism as well. So we exactly. can read each other very well. And some of my friends uh, are either having autism or uh, relatives with autism. So we can read each other very well. However, uh, in my work environment, there are colleagues who are not aware of autism. And sometimes I have to mask because according, uh, they don't give me that positive energy. They are very uh, taking away a lot of my energy. So I'm always being aware or thinking about, okay, how to communicate with them, how to express myself in order to be clear and not to be being interpreted as weird. Um, fortunately, there are just a few. All the other people are aware of it and they know how to communicate with me. Just clear things, clear ways. But sometimes with my family, it can be very hard because they don't, in some way, they know how to communicate, but in the other way, it's still hard for them. But we we are managing it. That's quite nice. So uh, the, the task that they gave you, uh, it is easy for you to, uh, you know, like tell them because you know how you, you are going to work along that task. Or sometimes it get difficult for you because uh, if you talk about uh, marketing, supply chain, or dealing customer on daily basis, and even if you you have to you know sell some product to the people, every day there's a new person. Like you have to deal maybe on daily basis new people, and new means anxiety. Anxiety means meltdowns. How you deal those things? So that is a tricky part. That's true. Um, good question. However, when there are new people coming in my work environment, so for example, new colleagues, this is um, pronounced one week in advance so I can be prepared. And that's what makes it very workable. However, sometimes there are still uh, situations which are, um, I don't know what in English, but it's called ad hoc, which may, which situations that happen spontaneously and for me that's still one of the things I cannot really cope with because I don't have any preparations I don't know how to react and I don't know how uh, to function them because I didn't have any preparation time so I have to be in a moment I have to feel okay what needs to be needs to happen right now that's that's still a challenge. Because novelty is challenge, but I know at the end of the day you are going to get that because that's how. And you know this is and the point is that uh, I just get to realize that thing that the problems that we have, everybody has those problems. This just the intensity is different. Like anxiety is something everybody can feel. Like nobody is anxiety prone. Everybody could have those anxiety. And if you talk about even emotional instability, emotional dysregulation, everybody could have those. And if you talk about executive function, dysfunctional, they can they can also get into those things. So if you are uh, like sitting in office and uh, like you have a hard day and you're at the urge of meltdown, are you able to read your body that you're having a meltdown or not? Because that is also important to understand because if you don't understand that you're going to get a meltdown and that meltdown is going to drain your, you for a week. So how do you do that? Well, sometimes when I'm feeling I will have a meltdown, I'm going to the copy machine, getting my prints or going to the toilet just to be away from my desk and from the office, which is very, which is fine, which helps me. And sometimes, uh, because I'm having an autism coach, I send her a text and she gives me a ring. And then after five minutes, it's okay. So I can go back and start from start from the beginning because my head is empty. So I'm getting away from my desks. I just will get me some coffee, get my prints, or go to the toilet. And stepping away from it is thinking about it and then, okay, if it's, it's, does it really have the high priority? No? Okay, then skip it and continue. I think 
with a like somehow you find the way you find your way out of that meltdown there are yeah. shutdowns too but we are talk we our conversation is more like we talked about your office environment what about your home environment you just mentioned that sometimes your family understand sometimes your family don't understand it how things are for you at home because home is sometimes for some people it's a very safe space for some people it's not a safe space just because of so many reason you know uh, so many discussions we can have on that but uh, what about you and your home environment how you do you are you able to unmask yourself at home or not is there some yeah totally that you can unmask or not like right now maybe you're not masking <laughs> maybe that's the energy we have no no i don't get the chance to mask with you which is very fine which gives me a really safe which is a very safe space but my home is my safe space i can unmask directly and sometimes when i'm having uh when they're uh, i'm having a very busy day at work uh i'm coming home and then um sometimes i get very uh I'm getting feelings that are quite sometimes depressive. And I think, okay, is this it? Will this happen? Will it ever get along? But that's just for a couple of minutes. And then I'm relaxing. I'm starting cooking or watching TV and then getting relaxed. I can empty my head. I can unmask, empty my head and getting my safe space. And that's, that, yeah, that's what I really need. So it it's like that you find way a way to unmask yourself um how much um the energy or how much effort it is required for you to come back to your original self not original self i would say because when you're unmasking then you're original it's not that you're fake when you're masking i need to clarify those things because people start thinking that you're fake when you're masking not you're not fake actually you're just trying to you know um get into that place maybe you want to relate to that place that's, that's why you said that okay we talk about masking we did not talk about streaming actually you just said a little thing about yourself that you like to learn to dance and things like that that could be a form of streaming too what about your streaming what is your streaming my streaming yeah do you, you know about stimming what do you mean with stimming okay stimming means be very stimming. broad stimming are some kind of actions it could be music it could be tapping it could be humming it could be nodding head you know like something like that some people have something which i like yeah it could be singing or you know some actions and autistic community or autistic individual maybe adhd individual do that because when they are not able to find some place when they are feeling anxious so they start doing something like that to feel comfortable to make sense of that environment ah yeah i see well sometimes when i get home i am putting on some karaoke tape and i start singing and it's very nice because i can express myself freely nobody's commenting only myself <laughs> it's very nice <laughs> and what about office like in office you are just sitting still or you're moving around well in the office i am always moving around i am getting coffee for myself or my colleagues or i am having a i'm going to uh, visit some other colleagues and it's it is very nice that's my steaming but those are the colleagues i am getting along with very well so the colleagues who gives me energy it's like you if you look towards yourself it's more like a movement and your personality is more like let me just try to describe it more like a outward you know like if you talk about language it's speaking communication and if you talk about your you are more interested in you know learning dance it's also a moving language so that is why it's quite an interesting part and that's why uh when you said that you're learning a lot of languages that's how maybe you find a way to relate to the external world you know just to find yeah. a balance between yourself and the world and 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 there's good that you find it out and uh, 
it might took a lot of time for you to reach to that level and um, doing all those things that you are doing and if you, you know sometimes in life there are some dark periods like when you are totally shut down how how you come out of those things what i did with the dark periods yeah like it's not always butterflies in your life you know uh, there are bad days most of the time maybe we could say that there are bad days what do you do on those days? well uh last year i had a very dark period because there were a lot of things happening uh in my family uh as well as on my work and it was giving me a very large meltdown and it was so heavy that i was having uh plans of getting out of it i want to get out because i didn't know and i didn't have the um, how to express it, I didn't feel as if it was mentioned for me as my goal was, my destination was here. However, I found um, I found out that there was a way of helping me. So I started a retreat. I went on a, on a retreat uh, trip to Ibiza, which is uh, an island uh, just under Spain. And they were organizing a retreat vacation. And during the retreat, I found, uh, I refound myself. Because the people who were training me, my coach is there. We were having a one-on-one -on -one coaching, which lasted one hour. And they found out that I was in, I was, so, uh, I was so deep in the sea, figuratively. I had to come out because all of negative energy, all of negative thoughts, all of the overstimulating for me which wasn't good for me so that was my sanctuary and i found out during the retreat that i was worth living for and i really needed to find ways in order to make it still more livable so surround me with positive people uh going to see my force again because autism is a strength and the force i lost in it i lost it going to believe that everything will be okay for me and not uh, being positive and not being negative. So I really had to find out, uh, I had to find out how it worked again. It was quite hard, but I got out of it. And I know if I wasn't, uh, if I didn't participate in this retreat, I wouldn't be that far as I am right now. So. I was very happy and I'm very proud of myself by doing this. Because otherwise, I would have really it's stepped hard. out. Like the, the, the thing that you're explaining, explaining, like I said to you that it looked like very easy when you talk about something and uh, and people would call you strong woman, strong woman. The point is that it's not a luxury being a strong person. You have to survive. And there is no other chance to do certain things and to do all those things. Yes. And we all have good that good days and bad days in our life. Even as a therapist, I would say that we all are human beings and we all are, have vulnerabilities in our life and we all could be weak. But talking about your weakness is not a sign of weakness that you are weak. It does not mean that you are weak. It means that you are able to talk about your problems so that you can come out of those problems. And complaining is not going to give you anything. Negativity about things. You actually need to find a solution for those problems. Like you, you somehow find it. We all need those places. We all need safe places around us. That safe place need, means that you are freely exchanging your ideas over there. No matter how controversial exactly. your ideas are. And the company that you keep, the friends that you have, they are able to listen to you and they don't judge you over that. They don't start calling you your fool, how you could be so fool. You are so fool. You should have done this. You should have done this and stuff like that. And they're not actually helping you, you know? And no. They are not helping you at all. And they are not even your friends. Do not call them your friends, you know? You can have other people, you know? And you will find, you know, there's, even there's a lot of online help too. There are a lot of, you know, um, uh, support group that you can join. I'm going to a lot of support group and I'm going to a lot of discussions. And there are so many things around us and you can find a tribe that you, that is going to listen to you. You just need to reach out to them and uh, exactly, you know, and and you have to save yourself actually. That is the point. Save yourself from yes darkness. 
you are amazing you are beautiful you are talented you are unique you are diverse so we have to you know celebrate your diversity and now i would like to i have taken a lot a lot of your time already and we can you know talk about that that for days and days and days without you know you know <laughs> be quite about that but now i would like you to give some message and uh, to conclude the whole discussion then i will thank you for coming to to my podcast and what message you would like to give what i really want to share with all um you mean with your viewers uh well we had we discussed already a lot of things um as first of all uh i really want to point out that uh being open about your autism or another um issue you are with is giving a lot of openness showing your vulnerability is really a force it is a strength and um that's my first point a second um try to think in possibilities instead of difficulties because there's so much more possible than you think um so if things are not going the way you want just think about what's possible so for example with my autism people always trying to point out the weak things mm -hmm. i'm trying to point out the positive things so the talents and the things are going quite well and the things i'm very good in and I'm compensating it in order to create a balance. So for example, just look at the things that are very unique because we are all both unique. You and me, we are unique. We would also be unique and they are very extraordinary. And um, always be open about um, what you're feeling because if you don't express it, people can't help you in the best possible way they want. Um, that's what I want to uh, give as a message, but also, uh, being strong doesn't always mean that things are getting very well. It also means you have to face challenges as well as face me challenges and seeing negative things in order to continue in a more positive way and continue in your life. That's what really helps me grow because I they didn't give it. I wasn't given this. I had to fight for it. And it really makes me happy that I came that far by facing all of these dark stages in order to continue to the more nice stages. So think in possibilities instead of difficulties. That was, that's what really makes you grow. And over here, I would just like to give you maybe not just you because you already get this idea and you are taking like you are saving yourself basically like when you go to the other thing that you just start doing certain things and you just take out of uh, time go away from your desk and shut down yourself so that you recharge yourself and you come back if you're like you said that you're just sharing people you need to understand that whom you're talking to find a place which is safe space for you you will get that safe place find out who is your real friend and find out that who is going to listen to you. If you're, if you, if it is, it is confusing for you, who is my real friend? It could be a person whom you can talk at any time about anything without giving a second thought. And that person is happy when you are happy. And that person is crying when you are crying. And that person is going to understand you and listen to you without any kind of judgment. That is your safe place and find out that place and talk to those people and communicate your problems to them. Communicate your problems and issues with those people. And at the end, like we all need some form of professional help, go for that too. That is going to help you out a lot, even if it's, it's, it's a form of coaching, uh, some form of support group, you will get support group also. And uh, at the end, like, like you said, that find out what you can do. It could be anything. It could be singing, it could be dancing, it could be art, and make yourself useful to that, other than maybe your profession. Try doing those things, and it is going to help you out to understand yourself more. And it would be a way of, you know, another form of expression for you. And that's what is going to make you. Really. So thank you so much for coming to us today, and thank you so much giving for the time. Like you said that, yes, we talk little about, you know, but we have to 
left something for our next meeting, you know, so that we find a way to meet again. <laughs> yeah, it would be very nice. Well, thank you too. It was very valuable and I feel very grateful working with on this. Thank you. We, we will just try to find a way to work with each other and, you know, maybe it's, it's a form of group, whatever we are, we are going to plan. We will find it out. I know we will because we both are, like we all are amazing people. I know that. <laughs> we all are. We are. Thank we are you. Thank you so much for your time. See you in the next, uh, very soon. Again. Thank you. Bye. Bye.